time to go freeze my sales socks. Well, actually, I don't want them to freeze. I, so instead, I'm going to cryoprotect them. Um, and so I can use a cryoprotectant, in this case DMSO, to prevent ice formation and use this like Mr. Frosty thing to get it to cool slowly so that the DMSO has time to get into the cells and do its job. Here's the basic overview. Um, we'll get way more into the details, probably more than you want, um, but I hope that at least some of you will stick around to get the details because I think they're cool. So basically you have some cells and you want to freeze them down. Um, these can be all sorts of different um, cell lines, talked more about in the past, like AGK cells, um, things like that. And you have these cells, you want to freeze, you've been growing them up and you want to freeze like little vials of them. Um, so that you have stocks that you can then use later to grow more from, because you don't want to keep passaging them over and over and over too many times, more than that in other places. But anyway, you have these cells and you want to be able to kind of like freeze them, but not actually freeze them. You want to cryoprotect them. You want to store them in a way that you can then later like wake them up. So you're kind of putting them into hibernation. What you don't want to happen is you don't want them to actually freeze. You don't want the water to freeze. When water freezes, it forms ice. And well, what's ice? Ice is this like crystalline network of all these water molecules bound into one another. And they do this in such a way that the water expands when it freezes and it kicks out anything other than water. So water is very exclusive. It forms these like water, water networks we'll get into. And basically when it freezes, it's gonna exclude everything else and just form these water networks that are gonna bulge out. And so then everything else gets more like concentrated outside of the water. And then the water itself is taking up more space. So it's a big problem for cells. Um, if this is happening, and this is likely to happen because inside of your cells are like 80% water. And then you like in your cell solution, there's like 80% water. Um, you have this water outside the cells, you have water everywhere. And so this is gonna be a big problem if that water freezes. There are a couple of main ways that it can cause problems. One is if you have ice form inside of cells and one is if you have ice form outside of cells. If you have ice crystals form inside of cells, these can cause like mechanical damage. Um, this is easier to kind of visualize, you know, like you have ice form, this ice is expanding, this water it expands, takes up more space. It's gonna mess up um, things um, because like, I mean, your proteins say, like I've talked a lot in the past about cryofreezing proteins. Your proteins are full, they have channels like full of water. And so if that water expands, that's gonna damage the proteins. A, a really big issue is that you could have this um, damage done to like the membranes. Um, and this is gonna be really hard to recover from if you're like breaking apart the cells. So water freezing inside the cells is one problem. Another problem is water freezing outside the cells. So remember, there's a lot of water out there as well, and ice can form there. What's gonna happen then is that it's gonna cause a couple of problems. So one is it's gonna concentrate the salts and other solutes. So basically anything that's dissolved in the water, when the water forms these networks, it's gonna kick those things out and the water's taking up a bunch of space. So everything that was in this whole water network is now in this like concentrated um, form. What you have now is something called a hypertonic environment. So we'll get more into this, but this is going to create osmotic pressure that you have more a more concentrated solution outside of the cells than inside of the cells. This isn't how it actually works. Uh, like It's not like the water is doing this to try to dilute that, but it has the effect where the water basically goes out of the cells and you can think of it as kind of trying to dilute that. Um, it's not actually what's happening. Um, it's more complicated, but that is the end of result is that you have more water molecules inside the cells um, and then water molecules, they're like diffusing in and out of the cells. Um, and because you have more water inside of the cell and you have outside of the cell, the water is gonna move out, out of the cell um, more in terms of like the concentration wise. So you have water driving out of the cells and if this happens too quickly, it can damage the cells. Um, so how do we prevent this? One way is by adding cryoprotective agents. So cryoprotectants, um, so it's called CPAs. What these are gonna do is these are gonna make it harder for ice crystals to form. They're going to form bonds to the water and that's gonna make the water not be able to form its water water bonds as much. And it's gonna make it harder to freeze. Um, this is going to lower the freezing point 
And therefore it's going to allow the water to enter this kind of like super cooled state where it's like vitrified, like it's, it's all like glassy and kind of like hibernating. Um, but so these cryoprotectants, um, so the ones we're gonna talk about most is like DMSO, which is this common cryoprotectant we use often at like 10%. I'll talk later about how there are problems with like toxicity and things like that with DMSO. And so there are efforts to kind of move away from it or mix it with other things. But what makes it really great is that it's able to, it's small and it's able to actually get inside of cells. Um, it's permeable or penetrating um, and therefore it's able to carry out its work preventing these ice crystals inside the cells as well as outside of the cells but it, in order to actually get inside of the cells it takes some time it doesn't get in as easy as water and so you have to give it time to be able to do that and so you don't want to like actually like flash freeze it instead what you want to do is do a slow cooling if you try to freeze things like instantaneously before the dmso has its chance to do things you're going to induce ice crystals because now you still have this really um high concentration of water inside of the cells um, and the more water there are, the more easy it is for the water molecules to find one another and to form these networks. Um, whereas if you have things dissolved in it, then it makes it harder for the water um, to do that. And so we don't want to freeze it too quickly or we get these ice crystals. Um, and therefore that's why we use these things like this Mr. Frosty freezing container. Um, what this is, is it has this like isopropanol um, in it, isopropyl alcohol. Um, this is a lower freezing point than water. And so basically when you stick this in the, you stick your tubes in here and you stick it in the minus 80 freezer, this way, um, instead of your cells being directly like exposed to that minus 80 degree temperature, they're going to experience a slow cooling because the isopropanol is going to be cold, but it's not going to be as cold, but the isopropanol is going to get colder over time. And so basically you end up with this cooling rate of about um, minus one degree Celsius per minute. You keep this in the in there like 80 overnight, and then you stick it in the liquid nitrogen, which has a like minus 120 something or whatever degree. And so then your cells, now that they're in this vitrified state, um, will be happy and you can keep them there um, and then wake them up later. Um, so this idea of like vitrification um, being that you your water molecules don't have enough energy and the molecules around them don't have enough energy to actually be doing stuff to be metabolizing and doing all of this stuff that would change anything that's in the cell. Um, and so everything's kind of just frozen in place. They don't have the energy to move around. They don't have the energy to carry out these reactions, but they're not in that ice form. Um, and so this is going to protect the cells in the long time storage. So now let's get into more of the details and I'll also um, provide links to some papers which are, um, which I found really helpful when I was studying this um, and um, so let's get into how these cryoprotecting agents are working. So first, let's back up and talk about why water has these properties. Um, so water is able to form these hydrogen bond networks with itself. Um, these are basically just partial charge, partial charge attractions. So we have the oxygen is what we call electronegative. Um, so the oxygen is attached to these hydrogens um, through these covalent bonds. And this means that they're sharing electrons and more on this in other posts, but the base, the end result is these electrons are, well, these electrons are negatively charged. The oxygen is hogging them. So this makes the oxygen partly negative and the, the hydrogen is partly positive, even though the water is um, neutral overall. When we have this separation of charge like this, we call the molecule polar. If we look at um, DMSO, DMSO is a polar aprotic solvent. So this means polar, it's got that partial, it's that separation of charge, um, but it's aprotic. So unlike the um, water, it doesn't have a proton that it can donate. Um, and why this is important is because it allows the, it still has this group that can form one part of the hydrogen bond, um, but it doesn't have the other part. So in a hydrogen bond, you have this special arrangement where you have a hydrogen donor and then you have a hydrogen acceptor. Basically the DMSO has the acceptor, but not the donor. Um, and so it's able to form interactions with water, but it doesn't make um, 
it makes the water kind of like not be able to form as many interactions and it can't form water interactions with itself as much, but it still likes it, the MSO. And so you have this situation where the water ends up um, in this vitrified state where it's not forming this ice, but it's still really, really cold. Um, and so I've talk we've talked before about, um, if you get confused by the slides, um, basically, um, we can freeze things really quickly when we're working with proteins. We often do that in, when we're flash freezing, but these cells are gonna be more sensitive and that's why we have to use this method with DMSO and with this slower freezing um, so that the DMSO has time to work. If you use methods with other cryoprotectants, you might, um, there are methods that work with like a snap freezing type of thing, but just if you get confused by this slide, that's why, um, because this was made when I was talking about proteins. Um, and for proteins, we often use like glycerol, um, as a cryoprotectant. So the water molecules are going to be sticking to one another and then the cryoprotectant is going to make it harder for them to freeze. And that's the idea with the cryoprotectants. But let's talk a little more about what they're actually, how this is, what this is actually preventing. So what are these stresses that we need to prevent? Um, so we need to talk more about this idea of osmosis um, because this is going to be a big thing, is this idea of osmotic stress. Basically, if you have a solution, um, osmosis is going to be the movement of water or the solvent, in this case water, from one side of a semi-permeable membrane to another. And so by semi-permeable, permeable, some stuff can get through this membrane and other stuff can't. Um, in the case of our cells, there are often specialized channels that things need to get through cells. So when you have all those salt ions that are getting concentrated outside, but there are channels that the salt can get through, uh, but these are often like active transporters and things like that, where it takes energy, it takes time, um, you have to exchange things. So it's not like they can just free flow freely through, um, whereas the water is able to more easily diffuse across the membrane. Um, because your solvent can move more easily than that other stuff, and because the other some of that other stuff can't even get in, what's going to happen is that the water is going to move back and forth, and it's going to move back and forth, and the end result is going to be that the water is going to move on net from a region of high water concentration, so low solute concentration, to a region of high solute concentration or low water concentration. Um, so you often see it talked about in terms of like hypo, hypotonic or hypertonic. Um, there's some technical difference, differences between osmotic and tonic and stuff like that. And I have more on that in another post. But if you have a situation that is hypertonic, it has more things, more non-penetrating things in it than something that is hypotonic. So if we talk about our cells and we talk about if ice is forming outside of the cells, it's going to be concentrating the solutes outside of the cells. So you have a higher concentration outside of the cells. This is going to be a hypertonic situation. Water is then, this basically means that the water has a lower effective concentration. It's like there's less water out there, even though you've, you've kind of just taken the water out of commission. The water can't come in now. So it's like you have less available water. Um, and this is going to make the water that is available, the water inside the cell, because you have more of it going out now, because before you had it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But now you take the stuff that was out here and you freeze it. Um, and so now it can't come in. So the water keeps come up, going out though. And so you get this end result where the water is driven out of the cell um, to, from this hypotonic, so from the state where there's um, less solute to the hypertonic, to the outside of the cell, and this is going to dehydrate the cells. Um, when we dehydrate the cells, if this happens too quickly, you can damage the cells. Um, so you don't want the cells to just like shrivel up and die. A complicating um, factor that might confuse you is that when we, some of these solvents um, or some of these cryoprotectants, you're still going to get um, dehydration of the cells. Well, you're going to be basically you're replacing the water with the um, with the cryoprotectant. And not all of the water, but some of the water with the cryoprotectant. Um, and therefore, you're going to be losing water. The cell is going to shrink a bit, um, but it's not going to be. You do it with less risk of the ice formation, um, which is why we control the freezing rate. Um, 
the yeah um but because you are getting some of that shrinkage and stuff you need to take this into account when you then go to thaw the cells and often you have to like dilute the cells um to you want to get that dmso out but you don't want to get it out like right like all at once so often you'll have to do um like stepwise dilution if your cells are very sensitive um so that you're not just then introducing them to osmotic shock because well now you put them in a situation um where you change out the media and now they have this osmotic shock because they were all shriveled up and now they can unshrivel and yeah so basically the protocols are going to vary based on the different cryoprotectant and some of the newer methods have um, like mixes of DMSO with other cryoprotectants. Um, so you have a little of DMSO, but less of that than you would normally. Um, but these either cryoprotectants, maybe they can't get into the cells, but or maybe they don't have as strong an effect, but they still have an effect. And then you can add to that to the DMSO, which has this um, this nice effect. Um, and then you can wake them up more easily. Um, so another reason why people try to get away from DMSO is there are um, toxicity problems. Um, and so this can be an issue with um, prior preserve preservation of like tissues and things like that. Um, more on this in these other um, post, these other papers I'll link, these papers I'll link to. Um, this was a kind of cool one. This one was really helpful. Um, yeah, but basically there are other molecules that people are looking into to try to have alternative freezing forms. Um, but DMSO is kind of like the go-to in the lab. Um, and it's also, we use it to dissolve a lot of compounds that are like nonpolar, so things that wouldn't normally be able to get into cells um, to make them like more soluble and allow them to get into cells, but then you have to get like decrease the amount of DMSO so they don't hurt yourselves. Basically DMSO is well known in the lab um, and we want to typically try to keep it as low as possible, but it is really helpful for a variety of things. Um, one problem with DMSO as well, though, is that it can actually kind of mess up the membranes a bit uh, because water doesn't, water, the membranes like water more than they like DMSO. Um, and so you can't just like make an easy swap between them. And there, there are other issues as well. Um, and, but I don't want to get too, too technical here because I've already gotten really technical. Um, but that's the basic idea with all of this, I guess. I guess this is all I really um, wanted to say. Um, yeah, and so if you want to know more about like protein freezing, I have posts on that as well. We often do that with like liquid nitrogen. There we're actually doing this like flash freeze where we're trying to get it quickly past um, the point where it freezes into this vitrified state. Um, and there are some methods that try to do that with, um, with the like cell culture as well. But in this conventional way, what you're doing is you're trying to slow it, sl cool it slowly um, so that that DMSO has time to get in there and do its job. If you cool it too fast, then you're going to have um, the higher risk of there being this um, freezing of the ice inside of the cells um, when you have the situation where they're placed in this hypertonic environment um, and they don't have time to adjust their balance. Um, you can think of one e really easy way to adjust your balance is to take water out from inside of the cell as well. Um, and so <laughs> that's one way you could get there, um, but that's not definitely not ideal. Um, and you have basically you have more water inside of the cells at that point because you haven't had time to make that balance. Once you make that balance, um, then things are less risky in terms of ice formation. And you can kind of swap things out, the water for the um, for your cryoprotectant, therefore lowering the effective water concentration and making it harder for the water molecules to link up, harder for the molecules to form ice. Um, so inside or outside of the cells, um, and different cryoprotectants work in slightly different ways and not all of them are penetrating. Um, there are some that are like sugars and stuff um, which stay outside the cell but can still have like an additive effect or, or a protective effect. Um, and there are different um, reasons why you might want to use one thing or another and it's going to depend on your cell type and your application. Um, so I will post the links to those papers um, and Hope this helped you and yeah, hope my cells survive this um, freeze um, or at least that the hand of thaw. <laughs> so it's always nice though to have your cell like stocks of your cells rather than just having um, your culture so that you have things that you can go back to. Okay, so hope that helped.